Every linear transformation has two subspaces associated with it. So suppose we have a linear transformation from some subspace v to some subspace w. Um, then uh, we get two, uh, two further subspaces called the kernel and the image. So the kernel of a transformation is all of the vectors in v, in the domain v, that uh, t sends to 0. Right? So this is very much like the null space of a matrix, except t isn't a matrix. It's a linear transformation. Um, if, this, if v were a, a full Euclidean space, Rn for some n, then t would have a matrix, and kernel, the kernel would just be the uh, null space of that matrix. But v doesn't have to be a, a full Euclidean uh, space Rn. It could be some subspace, in which case we don't really have a matrix for t. And so, um, and so there's no such thing as the null space of the matrix, because there is no matrix. So, um, so that's the kernel. The other subspace associated to a linear transformation is the image, and that's just all of the actual outputs that T produces in W. That might not be all of W. It could be some subspace of W. So both of these are actually subspaces. So just to prove that really quickly, so for one thing, um, since t of the zero vector is the zero vector, right? We've proved before that every linear transformation sends the zero vector to the zero vector. So that means that the zero vector is in the kernel of t. Okay. Furthermore, um, if we take two vectors in the kernel of t, Let's check if a linear combination of them is in t. Well, to check that, we are sorry, in the kernel of t. To check that, we can just pick two scalars, say a and b, and form a linear combination. And just check if this linear combination gets sent to 0. But look, we can, t is a linear transformation. We can use the linear transformation property. We get uh, a times t of v plus b times d t of w but t of e is 0 and t of w is 0. So this is a times the 0 vector plus b times the 0 vector. So this is the 0 vector. So what we showed is that a v plus b w is also in the kernel of t. Right? So this proves the, the properties that, um, that make kernel uh, the kernel a subspace. So kernel is a subspace. What about the image? We can do the same thing. So uh, t of 0, t of the 0 vector is 0. So the 0 vector is in the image. Right? The 0 vector is actually produced as an output uh, from this linear transformation. Okay, so now let's uh, suppose that we take two vectors v and w in uh, the image of this linear transformation, then we can choose, um, so v and, actually maybe instead of calling these v and w, I think in this case it would be better to call this w1 and w2. Right? w1 and w2, since they're in the image, the image is contained in w, so um, why well, I'm going to call them W1 and, and W2. Now, since they're the Im in the image, right? the image is just everything the transformation hits. So W1 and W2 get hit by the transformation. So that means that there is V1 and V2 in V so that uh, T of V1 is W1 and T of V2 is W2. These are all. OK, uh, so we started with two things in the image. Now let's ask the question, is a linear combination, uh, say a1, w1, plus a2, w2, in the image? Well, to, see, to check if it's in the image, we need to find something in V that uh, t sends to this vector. But look, there's, a, there's an obvious uh, candidate. How, uh, how about 
let's see what t does to a1 v1 plus a2 v2. Well, we can use the linear transformation property. So this is a1 t of v1 plus a2 t of v2. But t of v1 is w1, and t of v2 is w2. So right, this vector, a1, a1 w1, a2 w2, um, gets hit by t. So a1 w1 plus a2 w2 is in the image of t. And that shows that the image is also a subspace. Right. So this is no big surprise. Right? These are essentially the same proofs that showed that the null space and image of a matrix uh, were subspaces. But right, we don't have a matrix, so we kind of have to prove the whole thing over again. Um, all right. Uh, so just as an example of, of these sub working with these subspaces, let's actually do an example where we calculate them. So suppose uh, V is a subspace of R3 that's spanned by these two vectors. And uh, let's suppose we have a linear transformation defined uh, by uh, these two. Right? Now, so let's find a basis for the image in the kernel. So uh, one thing to notice is that uh, these, two, uh, these two vectors in our spanning set for V, these are linearly independent. So this spanning set of these two vectors is actually a basis. It's not just any spanning set. It's a, it's a basis. Um, so let's see. So let's find a basis for the image in the kernel. Well, the image, it's a subspace, and it's clearly spanned by these two vectors, right? Since, uh, since the domain space V is spanned by these two inputs, the image has to be spanned by these two outputs. So the image is the span of 2, 0, minus 1, and minus 4, 0, 2. So we have a spanning set for the image. The only question is, is it a basis? Are these is this spanning set linearly independent? Well, you know, in general, we could do a big calculation to figure out if these two are linearly independent. But since there are only two of them, two vectors are linearly independent if, or a set containing two vectors is linearly independent if the two vectors are not multiples. But these two are multiples, right? The second one is just minus two times the first one. So we can throw out this second vector and still have the same span. But now our spanning set is linearly independent. So, uh, so now we have a basis. A basis for the image of t is uh, 2, 0, minus 1. Or I should say is, not equals. OK. All right. So there's our basis for the image. Now let's find a basis for the kernel. So um, the kernel is just everything that this linear transformation sends to 0. But uh, right. so what we need to do is essentially find all solutions to this equation. Now if, t were, if the transformation t were given by multiplication by a matrix, this would be straightforward. We know how to, how to solve this sort of equation uh, when we're multiplying by a matrix. But t as a linear transformation uh, isn't given by multiplication by a matrix on all of R3, because the domain space for this transformation isn't all of R3. It's this, it's this subspace. So um, we can't we can't directly work with a matrix because this linear transformation just isn't defined on all of R3. So, um, but what we can do is, right, we have a basis for our domain space V. So what we can do is express, uh, express this vector little v in terms, of that, in terms of that basis. So T, we can write, uh, V has to be some linear combination of these two basis vectors. So we can write, T of a1 minus 1, 0 plus b of 0, 1, 1 equals 0. Right, so we're trying to solve this equation, or find all solutions to this equation. Um, so 
Well, now that we have it written this way, we can use the linear transformation property of t. So this is a times t of 1 minus 1, 0 plus b times t of 0, 1, 1. But these two outputs for t, those are the two that we happen to know. So this is a of, let's see, what was it? 2, 0, minus 1, plus b of 0, 1, 1. And this is equal 0. OK. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so now right, we're trying to solve this equation to find a basis for the uh, for the kernel of the linear transformation. But now we can now we can rewrite this as 2, 0, 0, 1, minus 1, 1 times the vector a, v equals 0 vector. So by, do, by doing this, uh, by writing this v in terms of the basis for capital V, and then using the linear transformation property, we've actually we've sort of gotten uh, we've gotten the original vector space capital V out of the game right now it kind of looks like we have a linear transformation from R2 to R3 right because there are two columns in three rows but um, oops R3 but uh, Right. Really, this R2 is sort of a stand-in for V. V is two-dimensional, and so right, once, we, once we do this, T, we've, we're sort of rephrasing things in, in terms of, we're rephrasing things as if the domain is R2. Even though it's not R2, it's V. But right, V is two-dimensional, so it's isomorphic to R2. So that's, that's the little game we're playing here. At any rate, now that, we have it, now that we have the equation that we were trying to solve written like this, well, we know how to find uh, a, right? Now it looks like we're trying to find the null space of this matrix. And we know how to do that, or a basis for the null space of this matrix. Right? We know how to do that. We can row reduce this matrix. So let's see. I can use this one here to eliminate the stuff above and below it, which will give me 2, 0, 0, 1, minus 1, 0. And then I can use this to so divide the first row by two so that there's a one here and then use that one to eliminate that one down there and we get one one so one zero zero one zero zero right so now the equation we're trying to solve looks like this remember we're trying to find the uh, all of the uh, combinations of a and b right so this means that a has to be 0, and b has to be 0, I guess. Right? So coming back up to here, or I guess here, right? linear, or the only linear combination <laughs> linear combination of these two vectors that get sent to 0 is 0 times the first one 1 minus 1 0 plus 0 times the second one, 0, 1, 1. So the, what we're saying here is that the kernel of this linear transformation is just the 0 vector is the only thing in the kernel. So a basis for this is empty. right? You don't need any vectors to span the, the uh, subspace consisting only of 0. All right. Um, well, so we, we have this. What seems what made this work is because v was two dimensional, we were sort of able to, even though it doesn't, this linear transformation doesn't have a matrix, we were sort of able to get a matrix anyway, because v is isomorphic to uh, to R two because v is two dimensional, 
And you know, it, it seems like we should always be able to, to use that trick, no matter what the linear transformation is, um, because no matter, the dom no matter the dimension of the domain space, um, there's some Euclidean space Rn that is isomorphic to it. So let's see if we can use that idea to come up with a, a rank nullity theorem for linear transformations. Right, the rank nullity, rank nullity theorem applies to matrices, but if our linear transformation is from a subspace to another subspace, there won't necessarily be a, a, a full matrix for this, right? Because it's not from Rn to Rn. Um, but if we assume that V is dimension N, then uh, uh, what we can do is, what we're going to do is build a nice, a nice uh, isomorphism between Rn and V, right? We know ahead of time there is such an isomorphism because these two spaces have the same dimension, but we're going to build a, an especially nice transformation. Um, and then instead of, right, W is, is some subspace in Rm, right? So once we've built this isomorphism S, you see that we can use it to rephrase questions about t into questions about s composed with t. I'm sorry, t, uh, yes, s composed with t. But s composed with t is a linear transformation that goes from Rn to Rm, and so then it will have a matrix, and then we can use the rank nullity theorem. All right, so that's the idea. Uh, since v is, uh, so v has dimension n, Let's figure out a, a relationship between dimen the dimension of the image of T and the dimension of the kernel of T, right? So the dimension of the image, this is, this is sort of like the rank of a matrix, and the dimension of the kernel, that's sort of like the nullity, right? So we can kind of expect, right, if T was from Rn to Rm, then the rank nullity theorem would just say that the rank plus the nullity is equal to N. Um, so we can kind of expect that these dimensions are going to add up to n. Right? The question is, how do we prove it? It's because right, this, these are analogous, but they aren't equal. So um, let's, first, let's build this nice, this nice uh, isomorphism between Rn and V. Let's start by, um, let's choose a basis for the kernel. So. Uh, I guess, why don't I name these dimensions? So the dimension of the image, let's call that i, and the dimension of the kernel, let's call that k. So let's choose a basis for the kernel. So it's going to have k vectors in it. So let's let this be a basis for the kernel of t, then extend this basis for the kernel of t to a basis v1 through vn for all of v, right? So if we write out v, or if we write out this basis like this, right, the entire thing is a basis for the full vector space V, and the first k vectors uh, are a basis for the kernel of T. Okay. Now let's define a linear transformation from Rn to V by uh, S applied to EI is VI. So here I'm defining I'm defining S on the standard basis for Rn. So by extending line, extending uh, with linearity, this defines S on all of Rn. And uh, you can see it's especially nice. It sends the first k standard basis vectors to this basis for the kernel and it sends the uh, rest of the standard basis vector to all the rest of this basis out here. Okay, 
Um, now, uh, since uh, since s composed with t goes from r n to r to w, which is actually sitting inside of r m, um, s composed with t has a matrix a, right? And um, the dimension of the kernel of s composed with t is the same as the nullity of a, right? Because the kernel of, if you're going from rn to rm, the, ker the kernel of the linear transformation is exactly the same thing as the, as the null space of the associated matrix. So, um, so these dimensions have to be equal. Also the, uh, the, also the kernel, the dimension of the kernel of s composed with t, well, right, the first, if we write out the, if we write out the standard basis vectors for rn, So here's the standard basis vectors for Rn. What does, I guess I should write, that, write this out. So what does S composed with T do to these basis vectors? Well, it, it depends on whether your basis vector is in this first piece or after that. So let's have a look. What does S composed with T do to these basis vectors? Well, for the first k of them, right, this is S of T of E sub 1, but that's S of, right, T of E sub 1 is V1, and S of V, sorry, I have this composition backwards. No wonder. This is uh, T composed with S. Sorry about that. So all of these are T composed with S. OK, so this, this should be T here. Right? S applied to, to E1 gives us V1. And then T applied to V1. Well, remember, V1 is part of the basis for the kernel of T, so this gets sent to 0. And then it's the same thing up until e sub k. These all get sent to 0. Okay, now e sub k plus 1, so s sub t of s of e sub k plus 1 is v sub k plus 1. Does that, could that get sent to 0? Well, no, because v sub k plus 1 is not in the span of the previous v's, so it, it is not in the uh, kernel of t. So this uh, is not zero, right? And the same thing for all the rest of these. So this is t of v sub n, and this is also not zero. And in fact, no linear combination of these is zero. So um, the dimension of the kernel of t composed with s, well, look, we... It, we have k linearly independent vectors that all get sent to 0. No other vectors, right? no vector that is not in the span of these, get sent to 0. Right? Since, these, since these vectors don't get sent to 0 and they're linearly independent, no linear combination of them gets sent to 0 either. So. That actually takes some proof. So if we had any linear combination of these basis vectors, uh, a, k, a, n, e, n, if we had some linear combination of these basis vectors that got sent to 0, well, we can use the linear transformation properties of uh, 
t and s to write this as t a1 times t composed with s of e1 up to a n times t composed with s of e n. Okay, but this is a1 times t of v1 up through a n t of v n. But t sends the first k of these, uh, the first k of these to zero. So this gives us a sub k plus one t of v sub k plus one plus dot 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 plus t. Sorry, a sub n t of v sub n equals zero. Okay. Now suppose this were possible. If this were possible, if this were anything but the uh, tri if any of these a's were non-zero, then um, so if this is not the trivial linear combination, then a sub k plus one times v sub k plus one plus dot 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 up through a sub k plus sorry a sub n v sub n is a new vector in the kernel of t. But that's impossible because right, t, the kernel of t is spanned by v1 through vk. Uh, and this vector is not in that span. So we found a, a vector in the kernel of t that isn't actually in the kernel of t. But that's impossible. So that means that these all of these a's from a sub k plus 1 to a sub n are all 0. Um, so all right, so what this shows is we have looking at t of uh, t composed with s, its kernel is exactly dimension k because here we have k independent vectors uh, that all get sent to 0. No other vectors, right? No other vectors get sent to zero except vectors in the span of these. So that means that these span the kernel. So these form a basis of the kernel. So that means that uh, the dimension of the kernel of t composed with s is k, because there are k vectors in this basis. All right, so you can see that um, even though we didn't have a matrix for t, once we sort of come up with one using this isomorphism trick, uh, the nullity of, of that matrix turns out to be k, which is what we would expect. OK, so now let's think about the image. What about the image of t? Well, because s is surjective, or because it's onto, because it's, s is an isomorphism, so um, it must be onto. Uh, because s is onto, the image of t is equal to the image of t composed with s. Right? So think, think about that, and, and you'll, you'll see why it has to be the case. Um, anything to hit by t also gets hit by t composed with s, because s hits everything in the domain of t. Uh, so that means that the d dimension of the image of t is equal to the dimension of the image of t composed with s. But t composed with s has a matrix. So the dimension of t, the dimension of the image of t composed with s is the same as the dimension of the image of the matrix that represents t composed with s. But that's the rank of a. So on the other hand, the dimension, of, uh, the dimension of the image of t, we call that i. OK, so we have the nullity of a is k. And we have the rank of a is i. 
So now we can use the rank nullity theorem on the matrix A. So the rank nullity theorem on the matrix A says that the rank of A plus the nullity of A is equal to n. Um, but the rank of A is i. The nullity of A is k. And i was our name for the dimension of the image of our transformation. And k was our name for the dimension of the kernel of our transformation. So those add up to n. Right. So this is, remember, and our linear transformation was going from v to w, and the dimension of v was n. All right. So we get this, this thing that's essentially analogous to the rank nullity theorem, but all right, this is sort of more general because our domain space doesn't have to be our n. It can be any subspace. Right, any subspace, but it does have to be isomorphic to Rn because it's dimension n. So this is a little bit more general, which means it's better. <laughs>